Section 23 of Astounding Stories, 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eight Men of Zlotli, by David R. Sparks. Chapter 13. No sooner did Kirby see comprehension in the girls' faces than he swung around and let go of his perch. As he crashed, caught the next limb below him, and let go to crash another, he had all he could do to suppress a yelp of joy, for all at once every voice in the ape congregation was raised in howls and screams of devastated terror. He did not care how he got down from the tree. Seconds and half-seconds were what counted. From the last limb above the ground he swung into space, and a split second later staggered to his feet clutched his rifle, and started for the clearing. His lungs seemed collapsed, and both ankles shattered. He did not care. Not when the ape screams were growing louder with every step he took. Not when he heard Nini and Ivana pouring down from their tree a continuation of the scorching fire he had started. Panting, his breath only half regained, but steeled to make the fight of his life, he tore from the jungle into the clearing just in time to see a twisting, pain-convulsed seventy-foot coil of white muscle lash up and strike Naida's cage a blow which knocked it like a ball in the air. Naida screamed and hung to the bars. But she was all right. It was not against her that Quetzalcoatl was venting his wrath. The blow had been blind accident. As Kirby stood at the clearing's edge, he knew to a certainty that Quetzalcoatl's reaction to sudden pain had been all he had dared hope. In front of him forty or fifty ape-bodies lay in a crushed heap while yard after yard of the serpent's bleached length streamed out of the hole, the hundreds of feet of coils already in the clearing suddenly whipped about a whole squadron of ape-men, and with a few constrictions annihilated them as if they had been ants. Across the clearing the leprous head reared up as high as the trees and swooped down, fangs gleaming. The howls of the ape-men trying to flee, the screams of those who had been caught, rose until they became all one scream. But Kirby had not left the safety of the tree merely to get a ringside view of carnage. He faced his next, his final task, unhesitatingly. Straight out he leaped from the shadows of the jungle into the clearing, out into the presence of the beleaguered, screaming ape-men. Well enough he knew that those creatures, despite their frenzy, might sight him and fall upon him at any second. Well enough he knew that a single flick of the white coils all over the clearing could crush him instantly but the time to worry about those hazards would be when they beset him. With a yell as piercing as any in the whole bedlam, Kirby rushed forward. High up in the moonlit vault of the night, swaying between the two poles which supported it, hung the white cage which was Naida's prison. By the time Kirby had sprinted fifty yards, he knew that his yells had reached Naida, for she staggered to her knees and looked straight at him. A second later, though, he realized that the almost inevitable recognition of him by ape-men had come to pass. Eight or ten of the creatures, left unmolested for a second by the serpent, halted in the mad run they were making for the sheltering jungle. And while one pointed with hairy arm, the others let out shrieks. Kirby gritted his teeth in something like despair. Then he realized that the worst danger, Quetzalcoatl's blurred coils, was not threatening him so far, and he went on straight toward the ape-men. He did not look where, how, or at whom he struck. All he knew was that his rifle blazed, and as he clubbed at soft flesh with the butt, blood spurted, and new screams filled the night. He felt and half saw big stinking bodies going down, and clawed his way forward, around them, over them. Then he felt no more bodies, and knew that he was through. A little farther he ran over the trampled earth, and stopped, and looked up. The howls of the living, the shrieks of the dying, deafened him. Renewed shots from the rifles in the tree made the serpent dash about in a dazzling white blur, smashing trees, apes, everything in its path. But Kirby, finding himself still safe, scarcely heard or saw. His eyes, turned upward, saw one thing only. Naida! She had snapped two of the withes of the cage and was leaning forward through the opening. Her face was livid with horror and exhaustion, but she was able to look at him with eyes that glowed. "'You—you you came!' she gasped. You came to me!" In a flash Kirby jumped over to the poles, and began to cast off one of the lines which held the cage aloft. "'Get ready for a bump!' he shouted, as he lowered away, arms straining. Playing out the one line left the cage suspended from the second, but let it sweep from its position between the poles down toward one pole. As the thing struck the tall support, 
Kirby bounded over to stand beneath it, only too sharply aware of the death waiting for him on every side, but ignoring it. Naida still hung suspended a good twenty feet above him. But there was no time to let go the other line. He braced himself and held up his arms. Jump! he yelled. Then he saw the white gown sweeping down toward him, felt the crash of a soft body against his, and staggered back. Recovered in a tenth of a second, he drew a deep breath and looked at Naida beside him, tall and brave, unhurt. "'Are you able to run?' he snapped, and then, the moment she nodded, motioned toward the jungle. Behind them, in front, on all sides, rose screams so horrible that he wondered even then if he would ever forget. As he started to run, he realized that when Naida had finally landed in his arms, the nearest squirming loop of the serpent had been no more than four yards away and that right now, if their luck failed, a single unfortunate twist of the incredible hundreds of feet of white muscle could still end things for them. But luck was not going to fail. Somehow Kirby knew it as they sprinted side by side, and the sheltering jungle loomed closer every second, and a moment later something beside his own inner faith made him know it, too. "'Look, Naida, look!' he screeched all at once. At the upper end of the clearing, where an unthinkable slaughter was going on, there leaped out from amongst a surging mass of apes, leaped out from almost directly beneath a downward smashing blur of white snake folds, a figure which Kirby had not seen or thought about for many seconds. The Duca's robe hung in tatters from his body. Blood had smeared his white hair, his eyes were those of a man gone mad from fear, and as he escaped the tons of muscle which so nearly had engulfed him, he began to run even as Kirby felt himself running. Straight toward him and Naida Kirby saw the man spurt, but whether the mad eyes recognized them or not he could not tell, nor did he care. All at once his feeling that they would escape the clearing became conviction. For suddenly the same single twitch of Quetzalcoatl's vast folds which might have finished them, if luck had not held, put an end to the Duca's retreat. At one moment the man's path was clear. The next— Kirby, running for dear life, gasped and heard Naida cry out beside him. The great loops flashed, twisted, and where had been an open way for the Duca loomed a wall of scaly white flesh. The living wall twitched, closed in, and as the Duca dodged and leaped to no avail, a cry shrilled across the night, a cry that cut like a knife. Kirby saw no more, but it was likely that most, if not all, the cacique had gone with the Duca. Somehow, anyhow, in but a few seconds more, Kirby dove into the spot from which he had left the jungle to enter the clearing. As Naida pressed against him, winded but still strong, he found his best hopes for immediate retreat realized, for Gori, Nini, and Ivana, down from their tree, ran toward them. "'She is all right,' he said with a gesture which cut short the outbursts ready to come. "'But we've got to keep going. Ivana, tell Gori that her people are gone, wiped out but that if she will cast her lot with us, we will not forget what she has done. Come on!" With Gory leading them, they ran, stumbling, recovering themselves, stumbling again. To breathe became an agony, but not until many minutes later, when they ploughed into the corner of a fern-belt whose blackness not even the moonlight had pierced, did Kirby call a halt. Listened long for sounds of pursuit, and relaxed a little only when none came to disturb the night stillness. However, that relaxation, now that he permitted it at last, meant something. The complete silence gave him final conviction that what he had said about the whole ape people being destroyed was true. As for the serpent, well, perhaps he was destroyed even as they were, perhaps not. In any case, the grip which Quetzalcoatl held upon the imagination of the people of the temple had been destroyed by this night's work, and that was what counted most. The serpent would be worshipped no longer. Kirby reached out in the darkness and found Naida's hand. "'Come along,' he said to all of the party. "'I think the past is—the past. And with Gori to guide us out of the jungle, and our own brains to guide us through the jungle of self-government after that, I think the future ought to be bright enough.' Ivana and Nini both chuckled as they moved again, and Gori, hearing her name spoken in a kindly voice, twitched her ears appreciatively. Naida drew very close to Kirby. "'What are you thinking about?' she asked presently. "'The temple,' he answered. "'About the crown which probably is still lying on the altar there?' Kirby looked up in surprise. "'Why, I had forgotten about that.' 
What was it, then? But what could I have been thinking about except how you looked when we came together in that gloomy place, and walked forward, side by side? Now have I told you enough?" Naida laughed. "'There is so much to be done,' Kirby exclaimed then. "'As soon as possible we must climb to the Valley of the Geyser, go on into the outer world, and there seek carefully for men who are willing and fit to come here. And that is only one task. Others come crowding to me every second. But first, what? Naida asked softly. The temple. Naida, we will reach the plateau some time tomorrow. All of the girls who kept watch there will be waiting for us, and it will be a time of happiness. May we not then go to the temple? There will be no priests, but we will make our pledges without them. Tell me, may I hope that it will be so? Tomorrow? Naida did not answer at once. She did not even nod. But presently her shoulders, still fragrant with faint perfume, brushed his. She clasped his hand then, and as they walked on in silence, Kirby knew. End of chapter 13 and end of The Ape-Men of Zlotli by David R. Sparks